Hello, I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. As some of you know, for decades, the American Council on Germany has had a special focus on bringing together German and American decision makers at the local level to share best practices. Our hope is that through the active exchange of ideas and experiences, these practitioners can develop policy solutions to common challenges. Today's common challenge is COVID-19, and cities are obviously on the front lines of the coronavirus crisis. To share how cities in Germany and the United States are affected, last month, the American Council on Germany launched a new series of conversations called Transatlantic Perspectives, the local impact of COVID-19. Today, we're happy to be partnering with the Office of International Relations and Sustainable Development in the city of Dortmund and the Office of the Mayor of the city of Pittsburgh to bring you this event. I'm delighted to be joined by Bill Peduto, the mayor of Pittsburgh, and Ulrich Sierau, the mayor of Dortmund, to talk about the corona crisis and about the, how their cities are emerging from lockdown. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Hello. Pittsburgh and Dortmund, of course, have a lot in common. Both cities are in coal mining regions that became economic powerhouses through the production of iron and steel. They've gone through periods of significant structural change and reinvented themselves to become centers of innovation. And today, healthcare is an important pillar for the local economy in both cities. And this is especially relevant in the current public health crisis. The focus of today's conversation is on how Pittsburgh and Dortmund are emerging from this crisis. But before we talk about the recovery, I'd like to set the stage by talking a little bit about how each city was affected by the pandemic. Mayor Sirau, let's start with you. How badly has the city of Dortmund been hit by COVID-19? Well, of course, it was a surprise to us, as for many other cities, when the first news came from, well, not only China, but from, from other places in the world as well. And in the beginning, it was far away. But then it started um, with infections in Bavaria in January in Germany. And then we started uh, to uh, get a crisis staff in order to be prepared for the crisis to come. We were one of the most early cities to start with that in the end of February. Many people said, oh, what crisis, what you're talking about? Uh, we said, okay, you will see that will be a crisis you have never seen before. And so this was the first step we did and we are happy that we did that because then when it was more and more emerging that, there we, uh, that we have problems there, we were able to uh, well, fix all the institutions, our local health service. We had good connections to our clinics, to the doctors in the municipality and we discussed what we should do. So we had a very good cooperation and we had a very good uh, structure, how to cooperate, how to take care of the patients who were coming to us in a growing number. Yeah. And then we had to discuss how do we take care? Uh, what do we do? We had to do the tests. We had to decide who is going to do the tests, what is going to happen with those patients who have a severe infection, uh, how can we take care, how do we isolate them, and uh, where do they go to, go, do they go at home, undergoing quarantine, or do they go to a hospital because they need intense medical treatment. Um, so in the first weeks, um, we learned a lot, but in the end, uh, we had very, quickly a well-established structure of cooperation as far as healthcare was concerned. Next step was that we started, especially when the national government and the regional federal government said, we have to undergo a lockdown. We were prepared for that. And all systems were more or less brought into a calm situation which was new. I mean, this was new for economy. This was new for public administrations. 
this was new for schools, uh, kindergartens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But people were very, very disciplined, I must say, and we had to uh, create a lot of festivals, cultural events. But people were saying, "Okay, we understand that this is necessary because we have to be really um, well have a shutdown in order to prevent the virus from infecting more and more people. We have to." Uh, cut uh, the infection chains. And so people were very cooperative uh, when we started with that in March. In the meantime, well, the situation is different, but I think we come back to that later. Yeah. So, but Bill I, Peduto, I, I, I or, sorry, go ahead. I, yeah, so, Bill Peduto, what about you? Um, how badly has Pittsburgh been hit by COVID 19? For the most part, we've been spared, and that is a combination between uh, people who were willing to listen uh, to medical experts that uh, kept social distancing and um, changed their lifestyles over the past couple of months. Uh, a second reason was we were uh, early on into the process. so. Wuhan is our sister city, as Dortmund is our sister city. And uh, we were in contact with them very early on. In fact, uh, even sending supplies to them uh, to help them back in January. We put together a public safety task force at the end of January and then created a uh, Delta team between several of our departments uh, to be able to put together what we would potentially need. So our public safety crews ordered our masks, ordered our uh, personal protection equipment, uh, worked with our hospitals to make sure that we had adequate number of ICU units, ventilators during the month of February, while our team prepared through the Center for Disease Control on simulation training on everything from losing 40% of your staff because of the infection to uh, having over 25% of your staff required to telecommute from home. And uh, we bought the laptops, we, we invested in the technology, and uh, by the time that March turned around, we had the examples of what had happened in Asia and in Europe to utilize in order to minimize uh, any of the operational side's uh, shortcomings. Uh, we've been fortunate, our, our numbers of hospitalizations, our numbers of fatalities have been low. Um, it also, much like Dortmund, uh, is due to having a strong medical, actually two strong medical centers located within the city of Pittsburgh and the cooperation that we've been able to have between our public safety and our hospitals. Um, this is something that I think is going to be critical as we start to prepare for post-COVID. Even though we're nowhere near the ability to do that, there will be a post-COVID period and we will talk about how we're going to rebuild our cities in what cities are those that will come out early uh, in that economy, I believe will be the ones that are able to combine medicine with different industries. Um, and I think both Pittsburgh and Dortmund are in uh, strong positions to be early leaders in that. Mayor Peduto, can you give a couple of examples of what you're talking about when you when you talk about the combination of, of medicine and different industries? Yeah, um, you know, we've been having conversations with all three of our uh, sports teams about what the potential is for hockey, baseball, or football to come back, what it may look like in those early times. And I think that a lot of that decision is going to be made by the players themselves. And when the players decide where they will play, the first question they're going to ask is, is it safe? Is it safe to participate there? If I go there, will I be bringing COVID back to my family? 
And if we can create a new industry that combines hospitality with hospitals, where new standards are created uh, that minimize any negative effect of the virus, those types of cities will be the ones that will be able to attract larger gatherings, uh, whether it is a sporting event, a convention, or any of those types of events that we've had in the past, with the certainty of a certain level that we can create of protection. And that will become a drawing force in that type of an economy. A second example, just here in the United States, is the film industry has been completely shut down. And studios out on the West Coast have scripts lying on the floor of movies that they want to produce. But they're not looking at New York. They're not looking at Los Angeles or Chicago or Philadelphia because the rates have been so high in those cities that it's hard to get the talent to come in to do it. Again, if you can combine the film industry with the hospital industry, and in cities like Montreal, Pittsburgh, and uh, Toronto, Buffalo, those mid-sized cities, Cleveland with the Cleveland Clinic, uh, there's a very strong ability to pull that industry uh, right out of the gate of uh, post-COVID to a city like Pittsburgh. Thank you, and, and thanks for bringing up sports. Um, obviously, sports are very important, both to the city of Pittsburgh, but also to the city of Dortmund. And there have already been a number of questions related to sports, and specifically the fact that tomorrow, the Bundesliga, the German um, soccer federation, will start again, and that Borussia Dortmund will play Schalke at home, but with no audience in the stadium. And so, Mayor Ciro, I'd like to ask you about the importance of restarting major sporting events for the city of Dortmund and what the, the challenges are for the city. We heard a little bit from, from Bill Peduto about that um, from the medicine standpoint, but um, Ole Ciro, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that? And I think you're muted. You need to unmute your mic, Mayor Ciro. Yeah. Okay, there we are. Okay, uh, as far as, uh, well, soccer is concerned, you, you're right. Um, the uh, Bundesliga stopped two months ago, and uh, it was the 14th of March. This derby between Borussia Dortmund and uh, Schalke 04 should have been played. Uh, the match would have been a match without audience, but they stopped it because um, this was kind of situation where the uh, Bundesliga said, okay, we wouldn't uh, go onwards. Premier League in, in England stopped and others as did, so they had to follow. Now, uh, in Europe, it's one of the leagues that's opening again, uh, one of the first leagues to open again. And so people are very, very interested, not only in Dortmund or in Germany, they're interested in all over Europe. This morning I gave an interview to a British Broadcasting Corporation because I wanted to know what we're going to do on that. So we have a split public opinion on that. Uh, people are upset because they say, why do we start with that bullshit? And others say, okay, it's time to have it again because we need some fun in the crisis. So because of that, it was finally the decision of the Chancellor, Mrs. Merkel, and the Prime Ministers of the 16 uh, regional governments to uh, allow these matches again. This causes a lot of problems for local authorities. We have a very good cooperation uh, with Borussia Dortmund. We have a very good cooperation with the police department here in Dortmund. So we have a integrated concept. That means that we have given several um, press conferences to tell the fans, please stay at home. Uh, the ultra fan uh, associations have themselves asked the fans to stay at home, to not come to the stadium, outside the stadium, uh, not to, uh, well, infect themselves through any forms of group building. And uh, we are discussing how we prevent the fans from getting if infected 
in a new way so that we do not have a second wave of infections. So far as we know, I mean, the match will happen in about 24 hours, but as now we have the impression that there's a lot of responsibility, that there's a lot of understanding in the fan scene and they understand that they should not get new infections because this is the guarantee to see and to enjoy the next derby, the next match between these teams. And um, so we think that people are very, very reasonable. We have groups that are not happy about lockdown and about many other things. And they started demonstrations over the last weekends in many places in Germany. We had a few of them in Dortmund as well. But we will prevent them from coming close to the stadium or to assemble in any other place in the city uh, to uh, have strange assemblies which are in a way connected to soccer but actually they are people who won't just use the situation for their purposes. Uh, the broad sports where well, young people do athletics, do soccer, etc, etc, is a different, different uh, aspect. Um, our regional government allowed us to reopen places, uh, playgrounds, um, uh, soccer grounds, uh, halls, but usually these areas, infrastructures are run by people who do that voluntarily. They are not publicly organized and they are very, very hesitative because they say if we open it up right now, maybe there will be new infections and we do not want that. We do not want to uh, take over the responsibility for that. So we are very, very reluctant right now, very careful. So I'd like to switch gears slightly. Um, one of the, the big topics that's been raised uh, throughout this crisis has been the interplay between the federal, state, and local governments. This has been true both in Germany and in the United States. And a high level of responsibility in responding to the pandemic has fallen on cities. Um, Mayor Sirao, I'd like to, to start with you and, and maybe ask you two questions. The first is, um, to what degree are you working with neighboring cities um, to, to make sure that you're responding collectively to this challenge? And how has the collaboration been between the city of Dortmund and the state and federal authorities? Okay, um, well, the cooperation with our local uh, municipal neighbors is very good. I, I would say the local family stands together. We have a very good cooperation in this part of North Rhine-Westphalia. We have structures, formal and informal structures for that. And this is a good situation for a crisis, crisis, crisis like this. We have a very good cooperation between the municipal health services, the mayor's made. We have a lot of telephone conferences. And so we have a lot of uh, discussion about measures, about doing more or less the same things at the same time, because we are very much interconnected. People are commuting from one place to the other in order to uh, go to work or to attend schools, etc., etc. So because of that, I've, I would say the, the cooperation on the local level is very good. As far as the communication cooperation with uh, our regional government is concerned, Yes, we sometimes meet each other. We have telephone conferences as well. But we are always um, a bit disappointed because the regional government does not enough consultation about the measures they are going to implement. Uh, sometimes it's coming from the meetings with the chancellor, with Mrs. Merkel. They have some ideas. They say, okay, we should do like that. They give press conferences. Afterwards, they administrate that, and if it ends up with us, we have to say, well, people, nice idea, but it doesn't work because of this, that, that. You did not uh, take into account that certain regulations are not feasible because of certain circumstances. And uh, so we are the ones who 
we have to solve all the problems that come out of that. And that makes it sometimes a bit an uneasy process because we are close to the people, the local uh, culture, local uh, economy, all they consult us because they say, okay, you are the ones we know, you are the ones we cooperate with, you are the ones we trust. So please tell us what shall we do? And then we have first to explain them that not we did the decisions, that it was a, a government from Northern Westphalia, or that it was perhaps even the chancellor, and that they had not taken this count certain, in, into account certain aspects. This is sometimes a very uneasy situation, and this has reduced uh, the understanding for the whole measurements. And so uh, we are not very happy about that. I mean, we are uh, administration of about 10,000 uh, public services for around 600,000 inhabitants, which means that we are quite strong. We have this Christ staff, which is very strong in cooperation with all other institutions we need for decisions and for visibilities. But um, it is, in a way, is it, there's a harmony in the main aims, but uh, then as far as administration from the regional government, from the federal government, North Hemisphere is concerned, and as far as, um, well, not only administration, communication is concerned, we we think it, it could be much, much better. I mean, we understand that it's a complex situation, but it, at least it would be very good if there would be more consultancy, consulting before decision making in order to prevent mistakes. Because we realized several times that decisions, decisions were made by the government and we said this doesn't work. And so they had to uh, uh, re-approach and we had a new solution three days later. And this was a go back, forwards, backwards, which nobody understood in the public. So it would have been better. We had had the consultation before, and then we could have opened one process. We could have launched one process. Everybody would be happy, would have been happy. So we are working on that. And I hope one day we will be, uh, we will have a big co coherence between the li different levels, between national, uh, then, uh, regional and local level. Thank you. Um, Bill Peduto, just yesterday, Donald Trump visited Pennsylvania, which of course is an important battleground state on the road to the November election. In the past, your administration has partnered with the White House um, under Democratic and Republican administrations um, on a variety of initiatives related to things like affordable housing, education, economic development, workforce preparedness. Um, in this crisis, how has the cooperation been between the city of Pittsburgh and the state government in Harrisburg and the federal authorities in Washington? Well, I, I think, you know, it's a different story in the United States. Um, we don't have national health care. Uh, so there isn't an organization at the federal level uh, that can just uh, come in and provide the services that uh, Pennsylvanians need. That's really being done at the state level by the governor and the State Department of Health. Um, they have been the, the main drivers of the implementation of operations uh, for cities throughout the state as uh, governors throughout the country have done. Uh, that sort of creates its own problems because obviously a virus does not know uh, geopolitical boundaries. And if you have different policies in place, it's difficult to contain the virus. It simply goes to the areas where uh, it has a better ability to feed off of human beings. So we have relied more on the federal level from the Center for Disease Control in the National Institute of Health in order to provide us with recommendations. Um, the United States is in a fortunate situation because we can learn from Asia. We've basically been given a two and a half month window to see the policies that countries put into effect, those that work, 
those that didn't. We can then look to Europe and we have about a six week window where we can see how different things, even this weekend in Dortmund, the mayors from around the world will be watching to see how they handle and how they're able to manage professional sports. It, it will have a big impact on what other cities mm -hmm. uh, decide uh, around the world. And we're all in this type of same situation. I think one of the biggest lessons of this is our constituents expect metrics that we have always given them. They want to know that on June 15th, things will be back to normal and you're going to be able to go into a restaurant. So they can start planning then in July, then we're going to go on a vacation. And in the thing about a global pandemic, it doesn't come with a calendar. It, it, it controls the, the calendar more than what government can control. So we have to use data and science in order to make informed decision making. But even with that, um, it's still a guess. Uh, we don't know where the world is going to be come September. And we don't know what will happen this winter if we'll find ourselves in a situation where uh, a vaccine has been created and, and the pandemic is slowing down rapidly, or if we're in a situation where the deaths and the hospitalizations are greater than what we're facing today. And trying to build plans around that become not only extremely difficult, they become impossible. So as we look at our partners, um, they're different. Uh, we're not looking at the federal government as the, the organization that will come in and be able to deal with the operational side. The operational side is left to local government, uh, the public safety, the parks, the, the sporting events, and all those other parts come down to the local government. Our partnerships at the city level are with our states. And within our states, the ability to put in the basic rules in order to provide our entire constituency a level of certainty that public health is being considered first. And um, there's a lot of people that don't like that way of decision-making. Mm -hmm. They think business should be first. They think their own rights to be able to do what they want to do should be first. And we're in a uh, situation where we have to fight those arguments at the same time that we're trying to fight a deadly virus. Mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously a difficult trade-off right now. Um, but Mayor Peduto, particularly since you just used the word metrics, I wanted to ask you both about metrics. Um, and so specifically related to Pittsburgh, as you look ahead, um, what processes are you using to determine when and how to reopen the city of Pittsburgh? And are there specific metrics or benchmarks that you're considering? Yes, um, we're blessed in Pittsburgh to have two of the United States leading research universities in the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon had created a um, influenza uh, forecasting unit, <clears throat> a combination of working with medical experts and those who can create algorithms in order to determine uh, where and when the world will be seeing outbreaks of an influenza. They did this over a decade ago. So they were able to adapt that to COVID. And with it, they have been able to provide uh, with the limited data that we have so far. And, and let's start with that, because if you're going to have metrics, you have to have data. Uh, the limited amount that we have so far, uh, a global projection of where hotspots may occur. Uh, we've also been able to uh, use that information at the state level where our governor has created a three-tier system, red, yellow, green, of what counties 
are coming out of the peak area or have plateaued where regulations can be loosened and which counties are still finding themselves on the slope up uh, where they have to remain under a certain amount of control. Um, those types of data in its infancy have been extremely helpful in helping us to make decisions. Again, does the public buy into that? No. No, when, when there are people out there that are claiming that this is no different than the flu, when there are people out there that are claiming, look at the number of people who've died, it isn't that many. Uh, and not understanding that there's a reason that it is not that many, and that reason is because the actions we have taken. They're not going to believe the data and say, well, if we go back to the way that we used to do things, here is a projection of how many people will die. And if we continue to be, use common sense, we can make that number much less. They're not making their decisions based on that type of information. They're making their decisions based upon emotion. Mayor Sirau, over your right shoulder, we see um, the, the buzzword for the city of Dortmund. This is how we do it. Um, and I guess I'd be interested in hearing, how are you doing it um, as you come out of the crisis? Of course, German cities are a little bit further ahead of where we are in the United States. Yeah. Um, and as community, as your community is opening up, uh, where are you finding the biggest challenges? And are you also looking at metrics and benchmarks to monitor how you're coming back online? Well, we are opening up, opening up gradually. Shops are open again. Uh, we, restaurants are open again. Maybe open again. Uh, sports may be open again, as I said. But uh, we are a company that uh, very densely. We have a lot of cooperation because if there's a lot of questions, we consult the actors. We consult our partners. We tell them how they should do it. If they have questions, we try to answer them. So it's a very intense communication right now, very good cooperation as well. So this is one of the challenges. But as we do that, uh, with a lot of digital means, we have a real digital push right now. Many conferences, many homework situations, many, many very productive uh, processes actually. So this is one of the positive aspects of the crisis. But it's a challenge to cope with all uh, these different challenges. It's very, very tiny sometimes. It's not the one big one, but the challenge actually is that it is so many new situations you have to find the right decisions for. And this is what um, is a challenge for us on the other hand. Yeah, we had a lot of good experience over the two, two and a half months in the meantime, which brought us together. Trust has been um, evolving and uh, we are a swarm intelligent community we consider ourselves to be that swarm intelligent place and that helps us a lot uh, we are as far as matrices are concerned we are really well very ambitious to keep the infection rate down and to keep people away from dying. We only had four people who died through Corona so far, uh, which is a very, very good situation for a place of 600,000 inhabitants. And it's a big place and we, we learned that big places are different than uh, uh, landscapes with a lot of uh, green and only few inhabitants. So we think this is good, but we do not want to have a new infection. And this is what we are um, viewing and, and measuring every day very, very intensively. So what we think in the end, we need a Corona exit program coming from not only the municipal government or from municipal parliament, it has to come from an alliance for that project. So we are cooperating with economy, with culture, with civic society, uh, we are cooperating with people uh, from 
uh, different institutions uh, who are not only experts, but who are actors, strong actors, we can cooperate with. For example, we have defined six projects in our city, which will be the main places for investitions into new work, new um, um, enterprises in order to reduce unemployment. We need to define how we reduce this growing unemployment rate. We uh, have to define uh, how we uh, work in digital ways because we had a lot of new experiences, but how uh, do we transfer them from this crisis situation into standard cooperation, into standard situation? We will give our municipal parliament a presentation in the middle of June, so it's only in about five weeks. And uh, we want to give them, present them uh, a concept, uh, what should be the steps, what should be the milestones. And this will not be a, pro a program or a measure, a mixture of, of step stones. It will be a program for about one decade. When Lehman Brothers got broke 2008, we suffered from that more than one decade. We still have effects of that crisis. And this crisis is much more deeper than this Lehman Brothers economic crisis was 12 or 11 years ago. So what we need is a middle range, long-term perspective. We have to see what would be the bundle of measures and then we have to apply for measures for money from the state government and from the national government and perhaps even from the European level. So we again have to produce coherence between many, many levels, which will be a big challenge to reorganize our cities, to bring them back to life and to um, well, uh, cope with all the econ economic damages we are suffering uh, from this crisis. So it will be what we need as a more or less a Marshall Plan for the next 10 years. Thank you. I'd like to fold in a couple of questions from some of our viewers. Paul Overby, who serves as Honorary Consul of Germany in Pittsburgh, um, sends his thanks to both of you for speaking today. Uh, his first question, focuses on the fact that most people are very eager to resume normal life. What are the political consequences of finding a balance between public safety and allowing your constituents to go back out into the community? And then as a follow-up question, um, how do you think elections in Pittsburgh this year, in Dortmund in the future, will be the same or different as they've been in the past? Um, Will campaigning be different? Will the voter experience be different? What sort of an impact will it have? Um, so, Bill Peduto, you're nodding your head. Let me turn to you first, and then we can come to Uri Siron. Yeah, um, it's interesting to, to watch it as it's unfolded over the past two months because a lot of the decision making that uh, is being made by uh, voters uh, is based right along party lines. So um, if you are a Trump supporter, you're more likely to want to see an open it now um, attitude. Uh, you don't want to see government having rules and regulations in place in order to minimize uh, negative health effects. Uh, you take a position more along individual liberty and um, a, a dislike of government in general, uh, in a distrust, in order to be able to say, I'm an adult, I'll, I'll take care of myself. Um, and if you're not a Trump supporter, you, you basically view this as a way of working together as a community in order to be taking care, especially of the most fragile or those that are uh, most likely to be uh, seriously harmed by this virus and understanding that uh, a shared sacrifice affects everyone 
and if we spread it far enough, the sacrifice won't be that great, uh, but we can have a direct effect in the feeding list. So when you take those two viewpoints and you put them on the map of where people stand politically, it falls directly into place. And what's interesting about that is whether it was Brexit, whether it was the elections in Germany or the elections in France, whether it was the Clinton-Trump elections, you see those same groups being polarized. And in places like Portland or in Pittsburgh that have a heavy industrial past, that have a, a history of the workers and being able to see them uh, rise in the post-war era, you see a lot of those that would have been in one side moving to the other. Um, and, you know, I don't know how that will affect this upcoming election. I, I realize uh, more and more that there are parts of this world that have been left behind, especially in the past 20 to 30 years, that aren't catching up to all the other parts of a new economy. And the people in those areas feel very much isolated. Uh, and they feel that government doesn't help them, it only hurts them. So of course, if they hear now that we're going to put regulations in place that you're not going to be able to do this, you're not going to be able to do that, they're going to feel further isolated. Uh, but it's a, uh, it is a public health issue first, a political issue maybe third or fourth. Mayor Sirao, what are your thoughts on the on the political process, um, but also the um, the polarization issues? Yeah, I think uh, what's happening now we are calling Corona blues. People are getting more and more the blues because they getting more and more impatient. They uh, lose the understanding. There is not as much acceptance right now as it has been two months ago because uh, people feeling more and more left behind. They feel that their interests are not uh, taken into consider consideration of the decision makers. So there's a lot of criticism about these decisions, about the decision making process. And this leads, uh, well, to polarization uh, on the left, on the right wing, we have a lot of uh, people who are on the, on the places, on the roads, on the public places we never experienced before. They are complaining. They have very strange theories about uh, hidden mechanisms of power. Uh, Bill Gates is one of the best enemies for those people because they consider him to try to uh, overtake uh, government in the world, strange situations. So um, what we see is that we have to explain a lot so that we go to the people, so that we have digital platforms for communication in order to reach as many people as possible, in order to discuss with them, in order to, um, well, explain, in order to, uh, present structures and decisions. This helps a lot, but still we have people uh, who are not understanding and who are trying to, well, in a way, cook, as we say, their own political soup with this crisis. And they, in a way, try with the upcoming elections we have, how many people they can recruit for their interaction. So what we try is that we want to shut down these recruiting processes from the extremist wings of the political spectrum. Uh, we have the local elections in the middle of September and we have national elections next year. Uh, supposedly in September as well, September 21. So in a way we are in the, in the uh, 
in the evening before these upcoming elections. And here in Dortmund, we have a very, I would say, uh, solid structure. Uh, people are down to earth and they are not following these guys. Many of them coming from somewhere else because Dortmund is a big place. They come here to assemble here, but they're coming from different places. But what we need is to give the feeling to everybody that we are taking care of him and her and that nobody is left behind. This is the most important aspect we have to do and we, we, we have to take care of when we act politically. So we have uh, organized cooperation, we have organized support for all the sport clubs we have. We are close with all the people in the schools. We are close to the people who need special health care and treatment. And they do not feel to, left, to be left behind. Of course, they complain that they can't see their grandchildren, that they didn't get visitors. This has been opened up now, so there is a lot of relaxation now. But I think we have to give them the feeling that they are not alone and that we are the ones to take care of them. And we, we, we are open. This uh, Christ staff we have is doing a very, very good job. Whenever there comes a letter, a notice, a question, they are taking care of that and they are having very small response times. So if you write a letter today, you get the answer tomorrow or day after tomorrow and usually problems are solved. And this, in a way, gives them trust in, into what we do, and they trust in those people who are in action. We have polls that say that the ones who are in charge of these processes, prime ministers, the chancellor, that in the political opinion right now, they get much more support than they had before. So in a way, the established structures are supported by the main public uh, uh, by, by, by the main public actors. We have a number of wonderful questions um, from our viewers coming in both via chat and um, via email. And I'd like to maybe combine several of them in one question and then ask you both a, a final closing question. A number of the questions we're receiving um, focus on mobility as a result of COVID-19. We've seen obviously a, a reduction in public transportation, um, particularly in cities like Dortmund, to a degree in, in Pittsburgh as well, I'm sure. Um, the question is, to what degree um, are you taking measures during the lockdown that might continue to be implemented afterwards? Um, and that includes you know, less motorized traffic, more bike lanes, that sort of thing. Um, but public transportation in general, do you see any changes happening there? And then we've also gotten a number of questions about whether you think COVID-19 will promote more international cooperation between city leaders, um, you know, whether there will be more opportunities for conversations like this, and what some of the lessons could be that come out of this for cities that can be drawn from this kind of international comparison. And I guess I'd ask each of you to maybe talk a little bit about whether or not mobility has played a role and whether or not there are any lessons learned that you can determine right now. Um, I, I'll just try to be brief about it. Uh, we have a uh, saying within my office and it's whenever we're presented with a question that is uh, based on the policy of where the city will go, you have to have a North Star. You have to be able to understand your decision making has to be based upon something. And with us, with COVID, it's been public health. So as we were getting lobbied in order to open streets and to do more interactions of getting people into public spaces, it was during a time that we were still seeing the pandemic rising the number of people being hospitalized going up, the number of people in the city dying going up. And the last thing that we wanted to do was to create policies that would encourage social gathering during that time. Now that we've plateaued, 
and that we're seeing it starting to decrease, we now can move from a strict public health policy to an open public space policy. Mm -hmm. We're looking at cities around the world and finding ways in order to be able to create multimodal solutions. On Monday, we will be presenting to the people of Pittsburgh the guidelines for what that will look like. But one of the biggest and the most critical parts of that decision making must come from the local level, from those that are directly affected, the businesses on the street, the property owners, the people who live around the block and in that neighborhood. They have to be the drivers of that conversation and not simply government coming in and saying, this is one size fits all for all these different neighborhoods and we're just going to implement it upon you. The people themselves have to be the ones that are the ones that are presenting it to government. So I, I believe that uh, as you have seen Europe starting to have less of an emphasis on the automobile in seeing this as a time in order to be able to give people more access through multimodal, you're going to see more and more of that happening across the Atlantic in the next two months. And Mayor Ciro. Well, as I understood that you asked on transportation and international cooperation, so I would start with transportation. Well, we didn't lock down public transport. We uh, got it more or less on the level we had it before. Uh, when the schools were locked down, we reduced public transport a bit. But we said people are desperate if they go into a public transport system that they are not too close together. So if you reduce transportation, we automatically bring them closer together than they want to. So we uh, more or less kept the, the level and this was quite successful. Of course, we lost customers and we lost a lot of money through that, but still it was better than if we had closed and reduced the public pro, uh, transport system. And uh, we had a lot of uh, discussion on that. Uh, there were other cities not too far from here. They brought it down, but they lost trust of their customers. The message was, we are there when you need us. And the people are really honoring that because they say, okay, we could trust you that you are there when we, when we need you. We have a lot of more cyclists. I myself are using my e-bike more intensively than I did before. But uh, there are many, many lots of people who are switching on bikes, especially on e-bikes. So this follows our line uh, to, to make the e-bike the urban um, instrument for um, the mobility change, mo mobile change. Uh, we have this, the biggest e-bike festival in the, at least in Europe, the organizers say the biggest e-bike festival in the world, uh, together with our local uh, uh, utility servant, uh, -E W, and uh, they are responsible for electric electricity and water. And um, we are following this line. So we consider this crisis to be an instrument to push the use of e-bikes. E-bikes so far are the missing link in the urban mobility. And through this crisis, it's getting more and more popular. So for the exit strategy, we will put more emphasis on using e-bikes and then proposing to our politicians that we have bike lanes for e-bike users. Second question, international cooperation. We have a lot of uh, projects with Africa. For example, with the Lake Victoria region in Kenya, with the uh, Congo River region, there's a boat with uh, healthcare traveling the Congo River and we are supporting them with money to cope with Corona crisis in Congo. Then we have a very good cooperation with Kumasi in Ghana. Uh, actually that is on climate aspects, but now we have transformed that, transferred that into Corona healthcare. And we have um, another 
um, health well, cooperative uh, uh, project uh, with a place in uh, Guinea, Western Africa, which is on waste management actually. But we have asked them, do you need Corona healthcare? And they said, yes, uh, we, we need. So our local bank, which is owned publicly by the municipality, they said, okay, we had to close down a lot of uh, culture events. Uh, so that saved us a lot of money. And we take that money for Corona care to Africa, which is quite a considerable amount. And yesterday I had a conversation with the head of one of our enterprises in the town. Uh, it's Vilo, they, they produce pumps and they have a very strong cooperation with Russia. And he asked me whether I could imagine that we organize Corona help for Russia over the local level. We, for example, have a twin city in Russia, it's Rostov on Don, and we have very strong links, very good cooperation. So we phoned and they agreed. They said, okay, thank you. We do not feel humiliated by that help. We are grateful for that. So there's a lot of getting together, a lot of staying together, a lot of solidarity. And I hope uh, that we uh, will one day, when the crisis is finished, we will build new coalitions on that situations. I wish we could go on. Um, there is so much more to talk about, and there are so many topics that we've not touched on. Um, some of the issues around social equity, some of the issues, Bill Peduto, that you touched on um, about the use of public space that we could obviously come back to. Um, questions about financing. Before we started, Oli Sirao and I were talking a little bit about the, the financial element of all of this and how cities are hard pressed and um, the people living in those cities are hard pressed. So um, rather than say goodbye, I would like to say Auf Wiedersehen to both of you in the hope that perhaps we can continue the conversation again at some point in the future because this has been a, a really rich discussion with rich questions um, from our viewers. And one of our viewers actually um, just sent a note by a chat saying his conclusion is that the crisis equals a catalyst for change. And um, I had wanted to ask you um, how you are both thinking differently about the long-term impact of this pandemic on your city and how your cities will have changed. Um, and so perhaps in a few weeks, we can reconvene again to continue this conversation. But I think that this has just been, been truly wonderful. And I wanna thank you both for making the time um, to engage audiences uh, across the Atlantic and across the United States. Um, I wish you both very, very well and your cities very, very well. I also wanna thank our viewers for being on with us today. Um, and for your active participation. Um, we've had literally viewers from around the world. So thank you, Bill Peduto. Thank, thank you, Ulrich Sirau.